through the lot, now you know I'm coming through When the growth look good on you, best believe they wanna screw now I've been tryna climb, devil threw me in the dark Baby, don't be insecure, you can still go make a mark like Blow. Could never let them drain my soul now Blow. Table turning like doorknobs, wow Blow. I think I'm about to set sail I'm a walking living legend, walking with my chest yeah. now Life keeps dealing me cards, I keep What's popping, people? What's popping, G? We're back in the building, guys. You really know the drill, man. You already know the drill. Please make sure you like, share, subscribe. Send this to your mama, your mama's mama, your mama's mama's mama, your auntie, your granddad, your whole nine, man. We're close to that 600 followers and um, subscribers, should I say. Hopefully, even by the time this video is actually put out, we have um, surpassed that 600 mark. Let's hope we can get it this week but if you haven't subscribed already please just hit that notification just hit that subscribe button heck you don't even need to have me on your notifications just hit the button man just hit the button but we're here we're here again to do another summer transfer target you guys can already see on the screen today we are here to talk about Jao Balinha so the fuller man the guy who a lot of teams have been interested in a lot of teams so interested that Fulham have apparently put a 80 to 90 million pound price tag on his head, which is obviously super duper crazy. Um, would I sign him for that much? Hell no. I do not think he is that good. Um, he's 28 years of age anyway. So, <clears throat> you know, at that age, I mean, you're not no Kimmich. You're not no Rodri. You know what I mean? You're not no... Heck, Declan Rice is going for 100. So if you're going for 80, you're trying to say that you're of that same level. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, two different players, I guess. So maybe people might see it that way. But in a general sense, he is a very good player nonetheless. And one of the reasons why I picked him as, you know, one of the players that I would at least take a look at, you know, in terms of just adding him as a target, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily someone that you have to go for. I just think with this whole Fabinho situation, you know, everyone's talking about it. You know, some people want a certain type of midfielders. You know, people want Florentino Luiz. Obviously, people want Lavia. You know, there's been talk about this Andre guy from Brazil. Um, you know, Graven Birch has been spoken about in some circles. You know, Manu Kone, obviously, he got himself injured. So, <clears throat> we're, you know, considering looking at him. You know, there seems to be a raft of players that so many different people want. But I just don't know if all of them fit the profile. Now, it just depends really and truly on what Klopp is going to do for next season, how he intends to play. But when I look at someone like a Polinia, I just think to myself, <coughs> I just think to myself, you know, you're looking at a player who defensively absolutely solid. Yes, he's 28 years of age, and that probably goes out of the Liverpool bracket of <clears throat> the kind of age profile, you know, of the type of player that we usually get in, you know, between like the ages, <coughs> excuse me, guys, and between the ages of about, you know, 21, 22 to like 26 kind of thing. Obviously, um, what's his name, Thiago might, you know, be in kind of an exception, but I still look at someone like him and, you know, with the way that Liverpool are trying to do deals and etc. I just think when I look at someone like Polinia, I'm thinking, you get him in alongside a Lavia or something like that. Now, obviously, that costs money. And obviously, we still got other positions that I feel we still need to, you know, sort out. You know, I'm not comfortable with that right central midfield position. You know, um, Zobosla has obviously come in. We still need to sort that out. Um, we need to back up to that. So, depending on who he decides that to be, left centre-back position, right centre-back or a right-back, if not both, you know, could potentially a right-winger. is Like, there's a lot of things kind of, you know, going on around the club that I think we still need to sort out. So you're talking about quite a lot of money if, you know, Palini is going to go for this hefty price. I don't think he will, but if he does, you know, it's going to be a lot of money coming out of your budget. So is it wise? Maybe not, but he's definitely someone I think Liverpool should be adding as a target. Obviously, let me know what you guys, you know, think in the comment section, you know, <clears throat> is he a player that you think, you know, we should be signing? Is he a player that you think, you know, Liverpool should potentially be looking at? I think people would, I think most people would probably say he is. But again, it does come down to that price tag, you know, kind of thing. And one thing I was looking at was his time, you know, not even at Fulham, was more his time at Sporting Lisbon. You know, when he was playing there, you know, they usually were playing with the back three. Uh, sometimes, you know, three, two, four, one kind of uh, formation, three, two, uh, four, nine, ten, yeah, three, two, four, one. 
Um, obviously here they're playing three four two one, and they three four three. You know, different variations that they were playing. Obviously, you can see him playing in that kind of pivot role alongside uh, Mateus Nunes. Obviously, he's now playing for um, Wolverhampton Wanderers. You've got Pedro Porro, who's now playing for Ch um, Tottenham. You know, so <clears throat> they have got um, a couple of players that he will remember from back then. This was actually my main thing that I was looking at was his heat map in one of the games. It just happens to be one, this game that I picked out. But this was kind of his heat map really in-game when he was playing for Sporting Lisbon. Something that I think Liverpool lack quite a lot, which is having their defensive midfielder drop back into that centre-back position, having someone to be able to fill that role. We spoke a lot last season, myself included, about Trent Alexander-Arnold, you know, not necessarily covering on that right-hand side, how we look at the right-hand side as our weakest area defensively. You know, it's, a, it's the one side of the pitch that gets targeted the most, you know, in, in more or less every single game, bar maybe a couple. Um, where the left-hand side was getting targeted. But it's the side, I would say, overall, across the season, it's the side that we are targeted the most. So if it's the side that we're targeted the most, I always think to myself, is it the players? Probably. Is it the manager? Most likely. Is it the way that we are set up? I'm going to go with that. And that's where we're having issues. We can't keep having a situation whereby you've got, you know, Virgil van Dijk and Canate, let's just say it's those two because it would most likely be them. We can't have a situation where they're constantly left isolated and we're, you know, basing our whole game on their physical attributes in order for us to get out of those type of situations. We cannot constantly rely upon that because the physical attributes of any footballer will always decrease over time. You know, it's not necessarily going to keep getting better, especially when they hit certain ages and when they get certain injuries, as we've seen with both Canate and uh, Virgil van Dijk, who have picked up injuries during their time here. Van Dijk, obviously the really big one, and Canate's picked up little niggling ones. Both will have an impact because of the type of players that they are. So when you've got a system that's very taxing, hence the reason why Fabinho at the age of 29 looks like he's completely dead, isn't because Fabinho's <clears throat> necessarily that shit of a player it's the system that they're playing in and one of the things i always see is that even in defensive transitions we're not helping each other out anyway people will tell, you know will say oh but we won the league doing this and uh, listen i've mentioned this before it is all factual 100 percent. i totally agree in that regards in terms of what we were doing but we were still vulnerable defensively don't let the sheer fact that we weren't conceding for you because we were still vulnerable defensively we were still being cut open it that's just the that's just what you get when you've got a fantastic goalkeeper, you know, behind you who's able to stop these kind of shots. But we were still vulnerable. And one of one of the things, I, not not the main thing, but one of the things that I always think about is the sheer fact that we never seem to have this defensive midfielder who drops back in. Why don't we have that? Why don't we uh, give Canate and Virgil van Dijk a little bit of a break? And that's something that I see Jao Paulinho doing quite a lot for Fulham mostly but during his time you know obviously at sporting that's something that he was doing you know quite a lot so i did find that quite interesting you know when i was looking at the stats and stuff like that for you know palinia before doing the video looking at some other stats obviously you got here um passes you know this is his passing stats anyway so this is one thing one thing he's really good at is switching the switch of play um, I think that'll be very useful in a Liverpool um, in the DM role, especially if you're going to play as a lone six. I think that that's something that we definitely would need, as well as him obviously being that aggressor in that midfield, somebody who can play to the level of intensity I feel that we are requiring from our midfielders. He's someone who can obviously do that. But again, his overall passing, no, I don't think it's that good. I don't think it's that great. You know, you can see at the bottom there, uh, third third from bottom passes completed in games, only 30, you know, puts him at 21 percentile, which isn't really, really good. Um, and then the rest of them, you know, it's not good in terms of even the passes attempted, you know, 36.89 um, per game, you know, that he's attempted. Now, obviously, context, system, team, role, all of these kind of things. Would that change if you move to a different team? Who knows? You know, who knows? I would I would think so, so to speak, but I don't see it getting much better. I don't see it as a thing like, oh my goodness, he's all of a sudden just going to turn into this. I don't think it's that. I think defensively, this is where he is so strong and where I even think he's better than Fabinho defensively for just talking defensive attributes. And again, he has got that switch of play in his locker. So, you know, playing those balls from deep, I can't see that being, you know, too much an issue picking up the ball from the centre-backs, you know, being able to actually drop back into that centre-back position. That's where, you know, his strengths lie. 
in here, just looking at this, I found quite interesting. Uh, miscellaneous stats, uh, tackles one, you know, he's ranked in the 99 percentile, absolutely fantastic. Aerials one, 92nd, you know, percentage of aerials one, you know, 93 percentile, you know, interception 72. You know, I'm looking at those kind of stats and I'm sitting there thinking, brilliant. Even the fouls drawn, you know, he's drawing 1.45 fouls a game. This is from your defensive midfielder. You know, what's he doing? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, he's drawing that many fouls, you know, within games. So, again, I'm looking at those kind of things there. And those are the type of things that when I'm thinking about a player, when I'm thinking about the type of midfielder I would like to necessarily see if we're going to play the double pivot, that is, next to a Trent Alexander-Arnold, I feel like he fits that bill because, you know, Ugarte was someone who had similar stats to this. Actually, both of them are really good when it comes to the defensive side, but maybe just on the ball, Ugarte was just that little bit better. Maybe that's what he's looking for, but I'm not that confident in the names that have been mentioned that they kind of all fit that bill. Maybe maybe a Florentino Louise might be the one of them um, who potentially fits that bill. Um, but for me, it would always be Fofana. I think he's probably the closest one, in my opinion, both on and off the ball, both in defensive and attacking transitions, attacking play, offensive play. I think he's more the all-rounded player that we're potentially looking for, but who knows? We'll wait and see on that. But if you're looking at someone who you just want that kind of dog and someone who's got the experience, played Champions League football, played Europa League football, played at the highest level, obviously, in Portugal. Now come, into, come over to England, he's played at that level. If you're looking for something like that in your team, again, he's 28 years of age. So guess what? If you go in and get a Lavia, You've only got like a year, like two years, three years of this player here where you don't necessarily need to worry about, oh, we're going to sign two players who are going to be here for 10 years. We don't need that. Sometimes it's about getting stopgap plus something else. And if you, you if your plus something else is as good as a Lavia, I personally think Liverpool are winning. But again, it will obviously always come down to, you know, the type of money that we may or may not need to actually spend on someone like him. We're checking out, obviously, him playing for Fulham. Again, he's playing in that double pivot here alongside Harrison Reed. Put him really, really good this season under Marcus Silva. I was quite surprised because, you know, they are a bit of a yo yo football club. So it was a little bit, it was quite refresh, refreshing, so to speak, to see them in this kind of position, you know, now. But again, this season, this was kind of their makeup and he was always in that double pivot, you know, position, picking up the, picking up the ball again from tossing. It's a D up, you know, from the, from the fullbacks. That's what he was really good at. And he was really good at dropping in. If one of them would decide to go mostly tossing, if he would decide to maybe bring the ball out a little bit because he's got that ball playing ability, he would drop back in. You know, he would just cover in and he's comfortable doing that. Something that Fabinho, in my opinion, wasn't ever really comfortable in doing. Maybe because we didn't need him to. Maybe because Klopp never asked him to. Fair enough. But if I haven't seen it, I can't then judge it and say, well, you're good at that. But because I've never actually seen it. And that's one of the things with Fabinho is I never realistically saw, you know, him kind of dropping into that mid, um, into that defensive area and just covering, allowing the wide centre-backs to be able to push out. Once the wide centre-backs are able to push out, they can cover their areas. But when you're always constantly trying to fight, you know, Canate is trying to fight with centre-back plus right-back. Van Dijk's trying to fight with centre-back plus the left-back area because someone like, you know, Robertson has pushed up, you know, things like that. It becomes problematic and an in transition constantly getting killed. Why do you think there's so much space in behind Liverpool? It's because of these little kind of things. So, you know, just one, just one of those kind of one of those little things, obviously, that I just kind of noticed, you know, with a Palini. And again, <clears throat> looking at his style of play here, uh, Palini is an astute ball winning midfielder. He's extremely aggressive defensively and never backs out of a challenge often diving into tackles in an attempt to curb opposition attacks. He's especially aggressive in stopping counter-attacks early by lunging into challenges, often preferring slide tackles in order to maximise his tackle radius. Uh, going to continue. Um, this ability to be effective in the counter-press is particularly important for a Fulham side that plays an attack-minded brand of football, as I mentioned about Marcus Silva's team, and is subsequently vulnerable to opposition breakaways. Not only is the Portuguese destroyer aggressive, but he's also extremely proficient defensively. He presses aggressively in the mid and low block and records a high volume of tackles due to his proximity to the player in possession. And we'll take a look at his defensive stats in a second. When compared to midfielders in Europe's uh, I think that's top five yeah, top five leagues, uh, Jao Pelini is statistically one of the most proficient defensive midfielders in Europe. He is a committed presser of the ball, ranking in the 99th percentile in pressures, successful pressures and pressures in the middle third of the pitch, as well as ranking in the 97th percentile in pressures in the defensive third of the pitch. And if we take a look here, again, 
taking a look, obviously, at his you know, absolutely brilliant. When it comes defensively, again, even the challenges are lost. You know, he ranks so low. Oh, brilliant. Love that. Absolutely love that. You know, tackles in plus interceptions, 5.59 per game, 99 percentile. Clearances, 1.1, uh, 1.77 per 90, 88 percentile. Dribble, the dribblers tackled. So the players obviously dribbling with the ball, 99 percentile that he is ranked in. Dribbles challenge, 3.88, 98 percentile. Tackles in the mid third of the pitch. Tackles in the attacking third of the pitch. Tackles in the defensive third of the pitch. Tackles one. Tackles in general. This guy is an absolute demon when it comes to the tackling side of things. Hence the reason why it depends on what you're trying to look for within your defensive midfielder because he can fit certain teams. I like For me, he's just a, a target. He's just a name. If you're trying to play away, for me, he's the type of player that almost reminds me a bit of a Makalele. Give the ball to the actual ball players. I don't need you to do anything. I don't need you to be able to dribble, even though he's pretty, he's okay at it. I don't need you to be able to hit a 70-yarder, even though he can do switch of play. I don't need you to be able to you know, do all of these creative things. Guess what? I just needed to win the ball back, be the guy in the team who can do that and pop the ball off. Pop the ball off. That's all I need you to do. You've still got Trent Alexander-Arnold. You've got Soboslai. You've got McAllister in the team. You've got Van Dijk. You've got Allison. You've got other players in the Trent. You've got other players in the team who can do these things for you. We just need someone because they can't do that. They're not as good at doing that as you. You're the best at doing that. If he came into the team, he'd be the best. I, I have no doubts about that. He proved that last season playing for Fulham. So why not get the best to actually come in. And that's where I kind of, you know, look at it when it comes to someone like a Palina. <coughs> Lastly here, uh, the shift to becoming a holder midfielder in a single pivot is a difficult one and does require far more discipline positionally in and out of possession. That said, Polina is an intelligent player with experience in the Champions League with um, Sporting Lisbon and with the Portuguese national team. These experiences often translate to an ability to adjust to role changes and an increase in the level of competition. Again, Someone like a Pelinha, I think it will just be the price tag. If his price tag, if his price tag was like the twenty million, I think that Fulham actually paid for him. Easy money. That would be the quickest deal that you would have to do this summer. But of course, they're going to want at least double the money that they paid for him last season to try and get him in. So that's where I'm a little bit like, mm, do you get him in? You know, how do we kind of see it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is going to be a little bit of a little bit of a waiting game, if I'm being totally honest with you. And again, there are other midfielders out there. There are other midfielders out there. I'm not saying that he has to be the chosen one. You know, it generally doesn't have to be so black and white like that. But he is definitely someone that I do believe that Liverpool should, you know, be looking if they're trying to replace Fabinho. On to Fabinho here. You know, again, I just, you know, I wanted to look at, you know, both of them from last season. Obviously, Liverpool had a poor season anyway, so... It's going to be skewed more in his favour in, in terms of some of the statistics. But here, you know, I highlighted there, you know, the tackles, the clearances, the inter you know, aerial duels won. Um, basically, that whole bottom row is all Palinia. Um, where Fabinho would excel his passes and things like that. Again, playing for Liverpool, who are going to dominate possession against 95% of the teams in that league. So even when we are playing shit, we're still going to be dominating possession. So again, it's going to skew in his favour in that kind of sense. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not asking him to do that role. I'm asking him to be that destroyer because we've never played with a double pivot before. So we needed someone who can almost do both roles. If we're playing in a double pivot, we don't necessarily need that. I kind of have someone else to do that, who can pick out those passes, who we give the ball to, to do those kind of things. You know, I don't always, yes, Rodri can do it, but he doesn't need to because Kevin De Bruyne is there, because Phil Foden's there, because Bernardo Silva's there, because Gundogan was there. You know, these other players who can play these kind of passes, Jack Greedish, who can get the ball down the line, you know, so many different variations. That's why, you know, um, I kind of looked at it like that. And again, you know, we take a look at Fabinho's heat map in a general sense. You know, if we're looking at his heat map, then we're looking at Palinia's heat map. You know, he's kind of, he's literally everywhere. Fabinho is mostly obviously in that central kind of position. But you're seeing Palinia, you know, he's, he's, a, lot, a bit more defensive, in my personal opinion, if I'm being honest with you, kind of. Fabinho looks like, obviously, he pushes up a little bit more. You can see just over the halfway line, you can see it is quite red. Yeah, you know what I mean? Over there, as opposed to Palinia, isn't really like that. His areas are kind of spread across more that back line in that kind of right half space at the back there, left kind of half defensive space as well. Um, again, just depends on what you are asking you know, from your players. And if you look at the comparison between the two players, you know, from the last season, 
as I mentioned before, passing, you know, this is per 90 minutes. <clears throat> Looking at like the passing and things like that, I expect it, you know, Fabinho comes out on top in every single metric here. You can see forward passes tend to um, Fabinho's 15.3 per, per 90 minutes, sideways passing, short passes completed. Again, he's only completing 27.9. That will be something that he would probably can, but will need to improve upon. But again, are you getting him into team in the team to do that role? But nonetheless, Fabinho is ahead in that metric. But then, you know, the thing here that I like quite a lot, again, is the duels, it's the tackles, it's the, um, even the fouls conceded, you know, it's less aerial duels contested, aerial duels won and lost, you know, that's where he's going to excel. So defensively, you are getting a better player, ground duels and things like that. So it's, as I mentioned, we're getting a more intense player. We're getting a player who can play on, not even play on the ground, but on the ground is very, very good. And he's someone who isn't going to lose that many battles in the midfield, the most important area. Yes, it's not your long-term option. I know that's what everybody wants. They want the true Manies, the Caicedos. If you can get them, then get them. But the realistic, re realistically, I don't necessarily see those kind of signings at this moment in time. Obviously, I would love for it to happen. So guess what? You kind of go out there and see what else that you kind of do. What, what type of player can we possibly get in alongside your Lavias or your Manu Kones or your Kefra and Turans, whoever it is that, you know, the hipsters want these days. That's who you, the, the, these Palinia type signings, I always feel that you need something like that, just kind of dotted around, so to speak, kind of thing, you know. So, you know, it's one of those kind of things. And last but not least, again, as I mentioned, passing, you know, completely there. But I mean, he's not too far off in his passing accuracy, 82% to, you know, Fabinho's 88%. Long pass accuracy does better than um, long pass att attempted. You know, it's not even too far off. So, you know, it's quite a good measure, you know, in that kind of regards. Passes in opponent's half, again, positioning of a Palinho who's going to be who's going to be playing a lot more defensive than a Fabinho Liverpool again going to have the ball more going to dominate matches a lot more than Fulham will so you know it's all context in that regards but look for me he is a player that I do like he is a player that you know has caught my eye this season um kind of came out of nowhere if I'm being totally honest with you in terms of the type of player you know he's kind of turned out to be but he's turned out to be a fantastic player you know over the course of the season um Obviously, Portuguese international. He's moving like he's at that stage now where he could easily have leave Fulham after one season, go to a top team, do your thing for about three, four years. The type of role that he plays, I, I think, if he goes to the right team, obviously, I want him to come to Liverpool. But if he goes to the right team, you know, he can. That's four or five years easily for him. Absolutely easy for him because of the type of role that he plays within that team. Teams need someone like that, especially a team like Fulham who like to play that you know attacking kind of brand of football. Go to a team like that that fits, who are good in those, good in those transitions. Hey, man, he might just be the the perfect fit. If I'm being totally honest with you, but guys, let me know what you think in the video. Let me know in the comment section below whether you guys think Palinia is a player that Liverpool should sign. You would like to see? Is it just a price thing for you guys? You know, let me know in the comments who your other options are in a general sense. Um, and then we can obviously go from there. Make sure you stay tuned for some more scout watches, some more videos dropping this week, next week, and the rest of the damn summer. And um, by the time this video drops, I think Liverpool may have already played their preseason game potentially. So, yeah, just make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you're hitting that notification bell. I'm G. That is my summer transfer target done and dusted. And we are out of you.